And then let's just briefly go over the syllabus. So everybody got the email I sent, right, with the syllabus attached and the textbook information? Okay. Uh, so I do just want to go over a few things with everybody just so that everyone understands. Uh, right. So uh, first off, um, so my email address is here on the syllabus, right, michael.moyer at gsw.edu. Uh, I prefer to be called Dr. Moyer, right? So remember this in emails as well, right? In general, particularly those of you who are first semester freshmen, are any of you first semester freshmen? Okay, well, I'll make this note anyway, right? Most of your instructors um, <clears throat> have PhDs at this point, right? So please do not address emails to us as Mr. or Ms. or Miss or Mrs., right? Uh, please, if you know the person you're talking to has a doctorate, address them as doctor. If you don't know whether they have a doctorate or not, address them as professor. So address me as doctor, right? My email address is right here. It's the best way to get in touch with me. Um, <clears throat> I usually respond to emails within 24 hours, except on the weekends, or it might be a little bit slower on the weekend. But in general, I'll get, if you send me an email, I'll get back to you within 24 hours. Uh, my office hours are 12.30 to 3.15, Monday, Wednesday, 10 to 12, Tuesdays and Thursdays. My office is room 239 across the hall, but don't come to my office, right? Because it's a tiny little closet and pandemic, right? So if you want to talk to me, I will set up a virtual chat room in Georgia View, shoot me an email, say, hey, Dr. Moyer, can we talk about whatever? And I will invite you into the chat room, right? I'm sure that you're already used to doing this, given that this is what we had to do last semester, right? You've probably done stuff like this before. Um, right, where was I going with this? Oh, the other thing, um, I have it in big, bold letters here, right? Do not contact me through the Georgia View email, right? I don't check the Georgia View email because I just, it, it's not user friendly. I don't like it. Um, so do not try to contact me through that. I won't see your email. Just try to contact me through a regular campus email. Okay, so we have on the sheet here the various university system approved learning objectives. Let me tell you quickly what my objectives are for this course, right? One, improve reading comprehension, right? I want you all to be better writer, better readers by the end of this course. You cannot be a good writer if you are not a good reader. Two, I want you to develop stronger bullshit detectors. talk about techniques that we can use to evaluate ideas to see whether or not they are adequately supported by evidence and sufficiently logical, right? We'll start talking about some of that stuff today. I want you to leave here with an increased vocabulary. We will be doing exercises to help with this over the course of the term. And finally, I want you to be able to write an original argumentative paper using secondary sources as research, right? So how many of you have written a research paper before? Okay, now was the research paper you had to write a research argument or a research report, right? Did you have to make a claim and defend it? 
Okay, so, so some of you have done this before. Okay, good. So we're not starting from zero. Um, that is always good to know. Uh, does anybody have any questions about anything so far? Okay, so if you do have questions, please do feel free to stop me and ask, right? Um, I am happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, so the two textbooks uh, for this course. Uh, Writing Analytically by David Rosenwasser and Jill Stephen, 8th edition. Uh, make sure it's the right edition because previous editions are actually quite different, right? And Reading the World, Ideas That Matter, edited by Michael Austin. These are both available in the university bookstore, or should be. I haven't been there today to check. Um, you can get them from other sources as well. You can find it cheaper someplace else, whatever. I don't really care how you get it, right? Um, you know, buy it from the bookstore, get it online, steal it, whatever, right? You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not your babysitter. I'm not responsible for your moral development. Um, <clears throat> but we will need to have those books pretty much right away, right? We're going to be working with them starting on Thursday. So it's particularly imperative that you get a copy of Writing Analytically as quickly as possible, but you're also going to need this by next week at the latest, right? So if for whatever reason you cannot get the textbooks by that time, come talk to me and we'll figure something out, right? We'll get some alternative for you, you know, whether um, you know, I get you a PDF of the chapter or something like that or whatever, right? Um, the reason why I cannot do that for the whole semester is because of copyright law, right? If I give you more than, say, two chapters of this book, then I'm breaking the law. Okay, right. So, textbooks. Um, what's the other shit? Need to talk about um, okay. So, in terms of what you're going to be graded on, there are going to be two major papers in this course. The first is going to be due around midterm, and it's going to be a close reading of a single text. I'll explain what close reading is probably by the end of this session, and we'll do, get a little practice with it. The second paper is going to be this researched argument, right? That's they're going to be the culminating project for the whole semester. Participation is worth 10% of your grade, right? Now, by participation, I do mean active participation, right? So showing up is part of that, right? If you show up and, you know, nod and smile and don't fall asleep, that's enough to get you a 70, right? That's kind of minimum passing participation. If you speak up and ask questions, if you go to the writing center, if you set up meetings with me during office hours, things like that, right? these are all things that increase your participation grade, right? So think about, think of 70 as the baseline, right? If I just show up and do everything, I get that bare minimum. And then you get more points for going above and beyond that. You'll also be writing uh, three short reflection papers. Uh, think of those as dress rehearsals for the bigger papers. Um, and we'll talk about what the specific requirements for those are as we get closer to the due dates for them. Uh, you're also going to be doing homework assignments out of writing analytically. And in addition to the readings you're going to be doing, you are also going to be doing some short vocabulary assignments, right? So let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, I have noticed in past semesters that a lot of my students have had a kind of pathological resistance to looking up words they don't know. And so, you know, your eyes just kind of glaze over it and you just you kind of ignore that on the page and then you probably miss the meaning of a whole sentence or even perhaps a whole paragraph, right? I want you to get over that. I want you to get past that. So, in order to do that, each time I give you a reading from the Reading the World book, I want you to submit to me the following class period at least three words that you had to look up. You will earn more points for giving me more words, right? 
I can guarantee you that in each of the readings there will be at least three words that you will all have to look up. And you know, the definitions don't have to be like, they don't have to be particularly original, right? You can just, you know, look it up on dictionary.com or whatever and like, okay, this is what this means. And you know, make sure also that you're paying attention to context, right? Okay, this is what this seems to mean in this situation when you're dealing with words that have multiple possible meanings, right? But yeah, the goal here is to try to get to expand that uh, what the Anglo-Saxons would have called your word hoard, right? The mass accumulation of words that you are familiar with. Okay, so any questions about any of the assignments? Okay, great. Um, in terms of our policies here in class. Okay, so first off, there is an attendance policy. Um, you are permitted three unexcused absences, right? What this means is that you just kind of get three freebies, right? Think of them as like vacation days or sick days uh, from a job, right? You don't have to tell me why you weren't here. And by the same token, telling me why you weren't here doesn't buy you more absences, right? You get three. So use them judiciously. Now, if something happens over the course of the semester and you have to be out for an extended period of time, the best thing for you to do is tell me right away, right? So say, you know, God forbid one of you does get infected with COVID, right? Contact me immediately, you know, let me know you're not gonna be in class and then we can set something up to help you keep up, right? because it's easier to keep up than it is to catch up. Right? Once you start falling behind, it's a lot harder to get back up that mountain, right? So the more, you know, the more information you can give me, the better I'll be able to help you keep up if you have to be out for a while. Um, and you know, the, you know, the other thing to know is here too, um, right, I can't help you if I don't know what's going on. So if you do have a situation that is going to keep you out of class, whether it's illness or whatever, right? Tell me at least the bare minimum facts that I need to know to be able to help you. And keep you enrolled in class and keep you on track to finish, right? And everybody knows right, that you have to pass this class with a C, right? That a D is not regarded as passing for this course. Okay, um, right. Uh, any questions about attendance? Okay, about our health policies here. Um, so um, I'm glad to see that everybody did show up masked and everybody has their nose and mouth covered. Okay, good, right? Um, everybody is distant from each other. Also good. Um, I will have spare masks if people need them. I am also going to expect everybody at the end of the class, I'm going to give you a rag with sanitizer on it, and I'm going to expect everybody to wipe down their workstation, right? Um, <clears throat> one thing to just remember, like I know that the masks are uncomfortable and they're a pain in the ass. I mean, I'm chafing under this thing right now. But remember that they're not just there to keep you safe, right? They're there to keep everybody in the room safe, right? This is an old building with lousy air circulation. Um, and not only are you keeping everybody in this room safe, you are keeping everyone they come into contact with safe, right? So as long as everybody is wearing a mask and washing their hands and wiping things down, then and touching as few surfaces as possible, then nobody's taking the, you know, taking the Rona home to grandma, right? Okay, uh, right, what else, what else? Um, Accommodations. Um, so some of you may have um, accommodations for particular disabilities. Usually these are things like you know extra time taking tests, things like that. That's not actually relevant to this class because we don't have tests. It's a composition course, but um, you get the usual drift. Anyway, like if there is any sort of accommodation I'm supposed to be giving you because of a diagnosed disability, right? You don't tell me about it. You go to disability services um, in Sanford Hall on the third floor. 
because of course disability services is on the third floor for whatever reason. Um, you take the note that, uh, you know, you take some proof of your disability to them. They send me a letter that doesn't tell me what your disability is because it's none of my goddamn business, right? And I give you the required accommodations, and that's all that needs to happen. So if you do need accommodations, make sure you take care of that as quickly as possible, right? Again, to make sure that you are getting that which you were entitled to from the very beginning. Uh, okay, so how many of you have used the Writing Center before? Okay, you have. Good. That's one of you. Does everybody know where it is? Okay, it's in the library, right? On the first floor, you walk all the way back. Um, so I do want everybody to note that I give extra credit on assignments if you go to the Writing Center. Going to the writing center and getting tutoring, getting help, this also improves your participation grade, right? So while I only give you the bonus on the big assignments, you're still getting participation points if I'm getting emails in the writing center saying that you're showing up, right? You know, plus, I mean, you know, it will help you write better papers. So it's, you know, there's that as well. Um, so let me talk briefly about the whole electronics thing here as well, right? Um, so since some of you came in and put your phones away right away or didn't even try to take them out, I assume that uh, my reputation on this precedes me for some of you, or that some of you know that Moyer is the guy who doesn't let people have phones. Okay, so let me just explain to you why I want you putting your electronics away, right? There's actually solid neuroscience behind this. Um, <clears throat> if you have a phone, in your hand, on your desk, in your lap, whatever, it's distracting you from whatever task you are trying to perform. We like to think our brains are good at multitasking. It turns out that human beings are actually shit at multitasking, right? We're not really evolved for that. Our brains evolved to help us to, you know, do our best. We are concentrating intently on a single task. And if your phone is out on your desk, even if it's turned over, you're not actively engaging with it, you're still seeing it over the corner of your eye, right? And you're thinking about all of those things that the phone connects you to, rather than what's actually going on in this room at the moment, right? And so what I want you guys to be able to do is even, you know, just a few minutes before class, just disconnect a little bit so that you can better focus on the work that we're going to be doing. You will do better work in the class. You will get more out of the class if you keep the phone put away. And you know, I may be your only instructor who requires this, but you'll probably get more out of other classes as well if you uh, just disconnect for a little bit before you go in. Okay, a um, couple more things. Uh, first off, let me just talk a little bit about Academic dishonesty, because this has been a slightly confusing point for some people in recent semesters. So, first, what I mean by academic dishonesty, right, how I define this for the purposes of this course. attempt to turn in work that you didn't actually do. All right, so any attempt to represent someone else's work as your own is academic dishonesty, right? Secondly, Any attempt to turn in work that you did not do specifically for this class without permission 
is academic dishonesty, right? So if you did a paper for another class that has already been reviewed and graded, and you don't tell me that, and you turn it in to me, does that count as academic dishonesty? 100%, right? Because you're doing an end run around, you're doing an end run around my assignment. <clears throat> if you go online, and you take some text that someone else has written and you change the words around. Is that academic dishonesty? Absolutely, because those aren't your ideas, right? So any, even if you're putting something into your own words, this is the thing I really want to stress because this seems to be where people sometimes get confused. Even if you're putting something into your own words, if they're not your ideas, that's academic dishonesty. Now, the penalties for academic dishonesty in this class, right? So the first offense will result in a zero on the assignment and a report with the student conduct office, right? I don't give people second chances anymore because I just got burned too many times. Remember that three reports in the student conduct office lead to suspension, right? So you do not want to get suspended, especially over little 500 word essays. Um, a repeat offense will be caused for failure of the course and another report sent to the student conduct office. Right, so uh, long and short of it, don't do that. And you know, we'll review some of the plagiarism rules and citation rules and things like that as we get closer to having assignments due, just so that everybody is totally clear on what's okay and what isn't, right? All right, so Title IX and sexual discrimination. Okay, so the reason I have to put this on the syllabus right again, I know you've probably heard this shit dozens of times already from all of your other instructors, but <clears throat> you know, this is the, the necessary first day spiel. Um, so, if you are the victim of any kind of sex-based harassment and you tell me about it, I am required to report that to our Title IX coordinator, right? I can't keep it between us. I can't say, well, you know, I, you know please keep this secret, but so-and-so has been harassing me, something like that, right? I have to tell Gina Wilson in the Human Resources Department, who is our Title IX coordinator. This is a legal requirement. Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't tell me things if you think I can help you, right? But do know that I can't keep them a secret if you do tell me. Um, okay, last thing here, uh, campus carry. Um, this I'm actually not allowed to talk about, but we do have the uh, information regarding the campus carry bill on the syllabus. Uh, with links that you can go to so that you know exactly what the rules are and what your rights are there. Okay. Uh, last thing to note, the way the syllabus is structured here week to week, so everybody understands, right, that what's under homework here is what I want you to do for next time, right? So, you know, for today, right, you know, 119, review syllabus, introduction to analysis, homework, read chapter one of writing analytically, right? I don't expect you to have chapter one of analytically, writing analytically read for today, right? That's what I expect you to have done for next time. And I also, I put it up here um, on the board, I also want you to pay particularly close attention to the section in writing analytically on what they call the method, right? That's pages 25 to 32. Because that's what we're gonna be using to pick apart text over the course of the term. So the sooner we uh, understand that, the better. Okay, does anybody have any questions at all about the syllabus, about course policies, about what we're doing here, about life, the universe, everything? Yes, Gary. Um, with the exception of the two papers, uh -huh. um, is everything else turned in to Georgia View? Everything is turned in on Georgia View. Um, you, yeah, you will never have to turn in anything that is on paper to me except these little sheets that I gave you at the beginning of class. Um, part of that is for, you know, 
en environmental reasons, you know, just waste less paper. And part of that too is because if we're turning things in online, then we're not touching as many surfaces, so it's safer, right? Um, any other questions about anything at all? Okay. Then I'd like to start the real class material here with a short thinking exercise. So I'm going to put a quote from a novel up on the screen here. Um, and this quote describes an animal without telling you what that animal is. So what I want you to do is guess the animal. Now, this is probably not going to be an easy guess. So I want you to take some paper out, take notes as you're reading, and try to put together a case, right? Come up with a, you know, come up with a guess and come up with a rationale for that guess, right? Not just what is the animal, but why do I think this is what the animal is, right? I'm going to give you one other instruction here before you start. There are probably going to be words in this that you don't understand. If you do not know what a word means, please ask me. All right, you can go ahead and get started.
Yeah, go ahead. What's dubs? Okay, dubs. Dugs or breasts? Antipathy means dislike. Yeah, Gary. Are we still doing words? Yeah, you can still ask me about a word. Is, is, is pudenda? Okay, pudenda. Okay, I figured that was one people were going to have trouble with too. Okay, yeah, so pudenda is the plural of pudendum. which refers to somebody's external sex organs. Take your time, put the pieces together, and think. Yeah. Could we do another word? Yeah, sure. Prodigious. Prodigious. So prodigious uh, means like exceptional or extraordinary. Whenever somebody feels like they have a guest, just feel free to speak up. Is 
Why do you think it's a monkey? Um, Okay. Uh huh. So that, that doesn't sound so much like a monkey, right? Also right back the end of the question mark. Okay. I put like the big monkey, like the monkey in like Tarzan, I guess. I don't know what the name was. That's what I called it. Whatever that thing was called. Okay. So why can't it be a monkey? Um, they get strong, distinct clouds. Well, yeah, it has no tail. Yeah, it has no tail, right? Um, and yeah, so monkeys actually do have claws on their hands and feet, right? They, they, they can use both equally well. Um, but yeah, it has no tail, so it can't be a monkey, right? And it says it's yellow monkey. Yeah. Right, black, and yellow. Yeah. Okay, I what, why else can't it be a monkey? Um, the first? The beard. This is a beard. Okay, there's, there's the beard, although orangutans have beards, right? The lack of hair. The lack of hair, yes. Monkeys are hairy, right? Okay. These creatures aren't hairy enough to be monkeys. So can we take the set of information that Gia came up with, plus the bits that we've just used to eliminate monkeys as a possibility, to help us figure out what this thing is. What is Lank? Okay, so Lank. Um, what's the best way to define Lank? Um, so somebody who has Lank hair, like hair that's kind of flat. Its hair can be lank or frizzled, right? Do we understand what frizzled means, particularly now that we know what lank means? Yes. Yeah. So frizzled is kind of well. Frizzled would be would would, would be an, an uncomplimentary way of describing curly hair, right? Mm -hmm. So kind of like curly and dry. Okay. So we've got a variety of hair types, right? Where is the hair located on the bodies of these creatures? The head and the front. Like basically the top half has hair from that. Mm -hmm. Except for the bubble. Except for the bubble, yes. <laughs> so can we think of a creature that fits that basic description? What if we look at the difference between females and males? It would be a bird, because birds don't really have yeah, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, plus, like, you know, if, uh, if the creature had feathers, right, yeah, yeah. he would probably say that it has feathers, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not a baboon? It's not a baboon. It's, remember, baboons, like, the only place a baboon is hairless is the butt, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't have hair on their faces. Or on their faces, right. They also don't have hair on their faces, yes. But these the males of this creature do, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds like some type of like superhuman. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're you're thinking along the along the right lines. What what makes this seem super to you? Uh, claws, climbing. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, the leaping ability. Okay, yeah, they, they, they leap very well. They can leap from tree to tree, right? But well, it has like human like features, I think, from what it sounds like. Yeah, so the creature that is being described here is a human being. Uh, no, uh, uh. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So, you would not hear this. Well, from the head down, kind of, they have beards. Yeah. Now, granted, the human that is being described here 
is a human that's in kind of like a very kind of like debased and primitive state. So this is from a novel by the Irish writer Jonathan Swift. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, the the claws are probably what's throwing you off, right? Yeah. And I think like you know what, what he means here by claws are just look like kind of like uncut nails, right? If you let your nails grow, they turn into claws, right? So yeah, so this is from Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, and the creature being described is in the novel called a Yahoo. And the Yahoos live on an island that's ruled by super intelligent horses called Whinims. Mm -hmm. Didn't they make a movie with uh, Jack They did. <laughs> they did. Yeah, that, that, that was a thing that happened. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah um, and most movies, like, this has been made into a movie dozens of times. Um, and usually they ignore this episode in the movies. Um, but yeah, so what we have here is you know, the, the traveling ship's doctor, Lemuel Gulliver, who seems to have a remarkable knack for getting himself shipwrecked alone in various places, um, <clears throat> observing these creatures for the first time. So what I would like to do now, now that we've put so the pieces together here and figured out what this thing is, what is the narrator's implied attitude towards this creature? Nasty. Okay. Mm -hmm. how, how can we tell he doesn't like their appearance? Okay, yeah. I never, upon the whole, I never beheld in all my travels so disagreeable an animal, or one against which I naturally conceived so strong an antipathy. So, yeah, so he, we, we can see by this last sentence that he finds these creatures really foul, right? Does he seem to recognize what they are? No, because he would like describe them as animals, so like goats, he could hear goats, yeah. squirrels. Yeah, he's making a lot of animal comparisons, right? He's comparing them to other familiar creatures. So he doesn't seem to recognize what this thing is, right? Yeah, well, it, it does, right? <laughs> but he doesn't recognize the similarity, right? So, you know, the narrator is it like, the author is having a little joke here at the narrator's expense, right? Yeah. The narrator is looking at these things and thinking, God, they're nasty, without recognizing that he's one of them, right? Now, what else do we see about... The, what can we tell about the narrator and about his attitudes from the language that he uses? What can we tell about the narrator and about his attitudes and general background from the language that he uses? Okay, what suggests that he's educated? Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it, it is true that in the mid 18th century, people who would have been reading this novel would have been more familiar with a lot of these words, right? But yeah, he has what we call a Latinate vocabulary. Meaning that a lot of the words that he's using are derived from Latin, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Latin was the kind of common language of scholarship in the Middle Ages and the early modern period. Um, and what it gave to English, or what, it ate, what English inherited from Latin, are essentially a lot of kind of like science words and technical terms, right? So the fact that, you know, when he's describing these creatures, he uses terms like pudenda and prodigious 
you know, you, you know, an anus rather than butthole, right? What does that suggest about the, the lens through which he's looking at these creatures? Is he looking at these creatures like an ordinary person who was a casual observer? He's not analyzing them. Yeah, he's analyzing them like a scientist, right? Yeah, he's using the language here of zoology to talk about other human beings. So this is all part of the joke, right? That because he's got his scientist glasses on, he doesn't see what the thing in front of him really is or how it's like him. So what we've done here is a good example of what literary scholars call close reading. So close reading involves taking small samples of text, looking for patterns within that text, and then thinking about how the parts are related and what that might imply or suggest, right? So it's about taking what is implicit in the text and making it explicit. Now to clarify what I mean by implicit and explicit here. So these are also words that come to us from Latin, right? Implicit comes from a word called implicare, which means to fold in. Explicit comes from explicare, which means, if implicit means to fold in, to fold out. Exactly, yes. So when we talk about something being explicit in a text, right, the explicit is what the text says openly and unquestionably, right? Mm -hmm. So we're just kind of looking at the kind of you know the literal meaning of the passage and the actual words on the page. So we dealt with that part by going through and putting the pattern together to see what the what the creature is, right? What's implicit is what the text suggests, right, the pieces that we have to put together for ourselves. So we had to figure out on our own, right, that Gulliver's attitude towards the yahoos is that of a scientist, right? We put that together by looking at the specific words that he uses. Um, and the kind of detached attitude with which he observes them, right? And the fact that he does not, uh, you know, and this also implies then something about scientists and scientific reasoning, because we also note that Gulliver doesn't recognize his similarity to the creatures, right? Because he's looking at them like a scientist and not like a person, he doesn't recognize his kinship with them. So these would all be things that are implicit, right? The text doesn't say this, but it suggests it, right? Pardon? Like implying it? Exactly, yeah. What's implicit is what's implied, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we're not looking for secret or hidden meanings here, right? All of it's right here. But what's implicit takes a little bit more work to get to, right? Right, there's no code here to break down. It's still just a matter of putting the pieces together. We're just seeing what the pieces suggest rather than what they, you know, say outright, right? So for example, um, if I give you a word, 
like Merlin's, what is the explicit literal meaning of the word rose? Yeah, it's a flower with a usually usually with a red bud, right, and thorns. But what other ideas are suggested by a rose? Okay, yeah, we associate it with love and romance, right? What else? Beauty. Beauty, yeah. Well, you know, when a poet is comparing his love to a rose, right, he's usually celebrating her beauty, right? There's also often, you know, mixed in with these ideas of love, romance, and beauty, a slight element of danger or pain, right? Because the rose does also have thorns. Oh God, yeah, yeah. Oh, that that takes me back to childhood. Um, surprised people still know that song. So, um, my mom's older. What's that? I said my mom's older. Of course. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Here we have the explicit meaning, right? And here we have all the things that the, that the word or the image implies. So what we're going to be trying to do with most of the text that we're going to be looking at is to try to pull these implications out. And then try to build arguments out of those, right? Why do these implications matter? So the big question that we're going to be asking ourselves repeatedly, or that I'm going to be asking you over and over again until you internalize it and start asking it yourself, is, so what? Right? Every time you make an observation about something, so what? Right? Now, this is not meant to be dismissive or to be aggressive. Right? By so what, right, um, it's kind of a shorthand that means, right, why does this matter, and what does this mean? And every time you make an, an observation, asking yourself, so what, right? Why do I think this is important? What do I think this means? Helps you move your argument along, right? And will help you connect various pieces of your argument to each other. So this is the, you know, the big question that is going to dominate the course for most of the semester, right? Now, I do also want to give you, before we call it today, um, a couple of useful thinking tools. Right? A lot of these, uh, some of these are just about kind of recognizing bad thinking habits that we tend to get into. Um, some of them are genuine positive tools. So the first that I want to quickly introduce you to is called Occam's Razor. Have any of you heard of this before? OK, so this is a concept that is attributed to a medieval English philosopher by the name of William of Ockham. And the basic premise here is that the simplest solution is most likely to be correct, right? By simplest, we mean the solution that has the smallest number of moving parts. So to give you an example of this, uh, since someone has already referenced 80s heavy metal, uh, when I was a kid, people across the United States, from all walks of life, even mainstream news media, were convinced that there were satanic cults running daycare centers and abusing children, right? Like in, in, in a ritual fashion. Yeah, does this sound familiar? 
It's going to come back 40 years later as the QAnon thing. Now, this was not happening. There was no evidence that this was happening. And most of the evidence that was used was kind of dodgy, right? Like, you know, psych psychologists doing repressed memory therapy on adults, right? Who were then remembering things they said had happened to them as children. When in fact, the psychologist was often planting suggestions into the subject's mind. So, <clears throat> heavy metal music and Dungeons and Dragons were regarded as gateways into Satanism, and so were kind of socially suspect, right? Now, um, in 1990, I think, in Reno, Nevada, two young men who were fans of a heavy metal band called Judas Priest did a bunch of drugs, listened to a Judas Priest album, went out to a, went out to a local playground, and they both shot themselves. One of them died. The other uh, permanently just, you know, essentially like he, he uh, changed his mind at the very last second and permanently disfigured himself, right? The families of these young men laid the blame on the music they were listening to. And they claimed that this band, Judas Priest, was including these backwards recorded subliminal messages in their songs. Now, when this actually made it to court, and it's actually kind of a surprise that it did, this theory didn't pass the Occam's razor test for a number of reasons, right? One, the difficulty and technological expense of including backward recorded subliminal messages in recorded music, right? That even if it was possible to do that technologically, it would cost a ton of money. Secondly, that the band had no motivation for wanting their fans to kill themselves, right? If you make your living by selling records, concert, concert tickets, and merch, right? If you want to put subliminal messages on your album, it makes more sense to say, go to the mall and buy our shit, right? Third, um, the sounds that people claimed to hear when they played the record backwards were better explained by kinds of chance combinations is that most of it ended up being nonsense. So the better explanation for this men's, the simpler explanation for these young men's behavior, for what happened to them, was that you know, they had few, you know, few career prospects, were both heavy drug users, came from unstable homes, um, and didn't see any future for themselves. But the families were looking to blame something outside of themselves, right? And so they focused on the band, right? A much simpler explanation is that the young men were troubled, right? Due to family and environmental factors, rather than that they listened to an album and went out and did this thing. So when we, when we talk about Occam's razor, it's, it's actually a good idea to kind of think of this as kind of like a razor paring away the parts of an idea that are unnecessary, right? Or the parts of, the, uh, parts of an idea that are too complex to be workable. Now, another thing that we want to be careful of is what we call motivated reasoning and confirmation bias. Does anybody know what, I, what these two terms mean? What motivated reasoning is? Or what confirmation bias is? So confirmation bias has to do with how we seek out information, and it refers to the human tendency to seek out data
that confirms what we already believe. And if we're seeking out data that confirms what we already believe, what does that mean we're doing with data that doesn't speak to what we believe? Not really paying attention to Yeah, that we're just ignoring it, right? And everybody does this, right? To some extent, everybody looks for information that affirms their worldview in some way. But, at least for the purposes of our courses here, it is a good idea to push back against this and to actively seek out a wide variety of views on any particular topic, right? To make sure that we are not then using these facts. Right? Motivated reasoning is then what we do with the data that we get from confirmation bias, right? It's like, okay, so I am just going to take all this data and use it to construct an argument that basically just confirms my worldview and that says that I was right all along. So one way to combat this is through constant self-examination. Right? Ask yourself, Why do I believe this? Do I believe this because this is what the facts say? Do I believe this because this is what the people around me believe? Do I believe this because it's easier or more convenient to believe this, right? And if a belief doesn't meet the criteria, right, that this is what the data actually suggests, right, then it's probably best to rethink it. Now, another way, another thing that we do that's related to this, um, that we can all kind of benefit from breaking out of a little bit, is assuming that the way we see the world is normal and natural, and is the way everyone sees the world or should see the world, right? How many of you have ever gotten into an argument with, you know, maybe like an older relative, and they say something to you like, well, that's just common sense? Okay, yes, <laughs> you have. What do, what do they usually mean when they say common sense? What do we usually mean by this term? Usually know. Yeah, things that, every, that should be obvious to everyone, right? However, what is quote unquote obvious to everyone can be very, very different, right, depending on where you grew up, who you grew up around, like what your social circumstances were, right? So to give you an example of this, um, many of you have probably guessed by now that I am not from here. Right, I grew up in Northeast Pennsylvania. Have any of you ever seen The Office? Okay, Scranton. Yeah, that, that, it, yeah it is a real place and that, that is where I'm from. So <clears throat> Northeast Pennsylvania is very different in a lot of ways from Southwest Georgia, right? Or at least it was when I was growing up there. I haven't lived there since I was, since I was 18, so you know, it's, it's been a while. But you know, it was, uh, you know, um, it was a post-industrial economy, or it had been an old coal mining region. Um, the most common profession uh, in the 80s and 90s when I was a kid was unemployed. Um, <clears throat> ethnically, it's mostly made up of um, Catholics, um, primarily Irish and Polish. And the biggest differences between there and here had to do with one, openness about discussing religion, and two, gun culture. Right, so by and large, you know, where I grew up, it's not that people didn't hunt or that they didn't own guns, but they rarely carried guns around with them in public, right? Usually people kept their guns locked up in a safe unless they were actively using them or something. So, you know, when I came down here and I saw, you know, people open carrying pretty much for the first time, you know, I, I nearly shat my pants, right? You know, I was like, what is going on here? Now, you know, it didn't occur to me that most of these people meant me no harm, right? Because where I come from, people didn't do that. 
the other issue, again, had to do with kind of openness regarding discussing religion, right? Um, it's not that people in Northeast Pennsylvania are less religious than people in Southwest Georgia, but church is generally less central to people's social lives. And it's also largely regarded a matter of private conscience, right? Where you go to church and whether you go to church isn't really anyone else's business. So what do you think the first question I got asked by a lot of people when I met them when I moved down here was? Yeah what, church you have, yeah, what church do you go to? Have you found a church home yet, right? And because I was misinterpreting the gesture, right? You know, people were asking, hey, come try our church, right? I was like, you know, you know I, I, I interpreted it as hostile and invasive, right? I was like, you know, no, no, get away from me, right? <laughs> this is, that's none of your business. And, you know, because I didn't really understand where I went, you know, and, you know Another big difference has to do with just sort of like levels of, like street level friendliness, right? By and large in the Northeast, like the rudest thing you can do is waste someone's time. So it was weird to me when people would stop me on the street and say hello and try to make small talk with me, right? It'd be like, like don't, don't you have some place to be? The answer was frequently no. <laughs> but, you know, um, because, again, like people don't stop strangers in the street where I come from. Um, when I'd been here for about two weeks, I hadn't even started the job yet. Um, it was July of 2012, I was walking my dog on Glessner Street, and these two guys in a pickup pull up next to me, and this is combining all of the fears I have about the rural south in one place, right? They roll down the window, and one of them says to me, excuse me, do you drive a Kia? And so I'm standing here thinking that they're going to shoot me, right? That I'm, you know, that I'm, you know, that I'm about, that, you know, I'm about to die. And then he just asks me this kind of inane question, you know, and I'm thinking, like, why does he even know that I have a Kia? Um, is it, yeah, does he get good gas mileage? Yeah. Okay, thanks. And then he rolled up the window and drove away. So you know, because I didn't understand certain things about where I was, right? I misinterpreted a lot of social behavior that I would not have perceived as, as threatening if I knew what was going on, right? So this is a thing that we have to remember is that you know, what is normal to us is not normal to everyone. And one thing that we're gonna need to do, particularly as we're reading texts, is to try to look at them through the perspective of the person or culture who created the text, right? What's normal to them? And how does this particular text line up with what is normal and natural to them, and how does it not? Does this make sense to everybody? OK, does anybody have any questions about anything before I let you go? I shouldn't have said the before I let you go part, because then of course you don't have questions. All right, um, so I'm going to give everybody a rag to wipe down your workstation. Um, so remember to read chapter one of writing analytically. Let me know if you need a PDF of the chapter um, and fill out the form that I gave you. And turn it on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And when you're done wiping down the desk, please just leave the garage uh, the empty desk. Have we already filled it out from the garage? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no reason to hold on to it.